Shalom. I'll greet you with a shalom today. We have a very special time together, a time of worship. What I want us to do in particular today, this morning, is to focus our thoughts on the power of the gospel. Let me read for you Romans 1.16, which perhaps in various versions you've memorized yourself. I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. First to the Jew, then for the Gentile. I want us to really think about that, the power of God for salvation. We're going to be hearing stories, five testimonies, of people who are being baptized today as they share how the power of God in salvation has changed their lives, brought them new life. You will also hear today from Larry Dubin with Jews for Jesus how God's gospel can break down barriers and uh, to reach the hearts and minds of Jewish people with the glory of the gospel and the wonderful news that the Messiah came. He is Jesus, Yeshua. So I I just ask that your whole mind and heart today will be focused on that, even as we are singing songs, as we're praying, as we're reading scripture, um, to think about the power of the gospel and even what is your story. How God has, if you are a believer in Jesus, how God has developed in you a story that even the angels in heaven are jumping up and down and praising, singing about. If you're a guest with us today, I particularly want to uh, welcome you and invite you to share with us a little bit about who you are and if there is any way that we could maybe help you, provide some information, or if there are any uh, prayer requests that you would like to share with us. You'll notice in our bulletin when you open it up, there is a welcome card. And use that to let us know who you are and any way we can help. And on the back side, you notice a place for prayer requests. Again, we are so thankful that you are here with us today, and let's all together focus on the power of the gospel. Oh, it's so serious. Uh, uh, what's going to happen next? Good morning. Good morning. It's great to have you with us. It's Sunday again. And you have brought the church into these four walls. Isn't that incredible? Like, you didn't come to church. You are the church. This is church because you are here this morning. And we're so grateful for that. We're, our desire is that Forsey would be a sanctuary. You know, that, that this would be just that. It would be a safe place. This would be a, a sanctuary that you could come and maybe tune out some of the distractions of your normal daily grind and commune with the body of Christ and experience the presence of the Lord in a way that only happens when his people gather together in his name. And we've gathered in the name of Jesus. We are gathering in the name of Jesus this morning. I'm going to invite you to stand and we're going to share together our scriptural call to worship from Psalm 95 that we've been learning together. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before Him with thanksgiving and extol Him with music and with song. For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. For He is our God. We are His people the people of his his pasture, the flock under under his his care. care. Today, Today, if if you you hear hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. hearts. Let's say that again. Today, Today, if if you you hear hear his voice, voice, do not not harden harden your hearts. hearts. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. For his love that came for us, Humbled to a sinner's cross, you broke my shame and sinfulness. You rose again, victorious. Faithfulness, no one can deny God's faithfulness. 
faithfulness none can deny through the sword and through the fire there is truth that sets me free Jesus Christ who lives in me you are stronger you are stronger sin is broken you have saved me it is written Christ is risen Jesus you are Lord of all no beginning and no end you're my hope and my defense you came to see and save the lost you paid it all upon the any darkness that would come against us. He is Lord, the cornerstone of our lives, the rock of our salvation. Let's proclaim this together. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. But holy trust in Jesus' name. My hope, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest phrase. Cornerstone. 
darkness seems to hide his face. When darkness seems to hide his face, oh. I rent the hair, a changing grave. And every high and stormy gale, and every high and stormy gale, our anchor holds, my anchor holds within. Father, we gather in the name of your son Jesus this morning. We thank you that we can say that you are our cornerstone as it has been proclaimed in scripture. You were the stone that the builders rejected. But upon that, Lord, you have become the chief cornerstone. Lord, we thank you for the gathering that we have together this morning and the opportunity that we have to witness these people who are proclaiming that you are the Lord of all in their lives. Lord, we ask that even as we watch their proclamation and baptism, that you would remind us, that you would remind us of that time and that commitment that we made and renew our commitment to you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. symbol, uh, a public demonstration of our faith, a public expression of the fact that we identify with Jesus Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection, and in his new life. And, uh, you know, we publicly, when we get baptized, when each person gets baptized, what you're doing, you are publicly declaring before God, before other believers and unbelievers and your family and friends, and even to yourself so that you can hear with your own ears that you are a follower of Jesus and you identify with him and you're making a commitment to follow him as a fully devoted follower of Christ. It doesn't mean that you'll do that perfectly, but your commitment is to be a fully devoted follower of Christ. And so it's an exciting thing to see people saved and to see them make that step of baptism. We have five candidates uh, this morning and that's amazing and it's exciting. And so what we're going to start with Therese Moorhead, why don't you come and share your testimony with us? Good morning. My name is Trace Moorhead. I grew up in the Catholic Church, but
but now I attend University Bible Fellowship. I knew about God and Jesus, but never knew, had a personal relationship with Jesus Christ growing up. When I was young, I was exposed to pornography, which warped my view about sex. When I went to school, I didn't do well, so I cheated off my friends' and ho friends' homework. I tried drugs to gain acceptance of friends, through, though I knew it was terribly wrong. My main sin problem was that I thirsted for man's love instead of God's love. My friend and I drove to New York to get fake IDs to get into nightclubs to find a boyfriend when I was a teen. I committed the sin of premarital sex, which I knew as a Catholic was a sin against God. I went to the priest for confession, and he told me to say Hail Marys and the Lord's Prayer each night to re repent of my sin. I did. One time I committed the sin of premarital sex with this loser guy. I thought I was pregnant. I was, I was young and thought surely my dad would kick me out of, out of the house if he knew I was pregnant and committed the sin of premarital sex. I didn't want to get an abortion, so I cried out to God, Lord, if you make me not be pregnant, I will serve you all my days. I went that week to get a pregnancy test and the test came out negative. I knew I owed God my whole life, but I didn't know what to do. I thought, do I need to become a nun? About six months after this incident, my brother started Bible study with a college student ministry called University Bible Fellowship. He used to beat me up all the time, but I, I saw him change and become hap so happy and kind because of Bible study. I was growing weary of going to parties and nightclubs and felt empty inside. My brother invited me to Bible study with, with this missionary. Through it, I learned the Creator God from Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. I realized God created the world for man and woman to enjoy to, and to take care of. Then through John chapter 4, where Jesus spoke to a Samaritan woman, who had had five husbands and one roommate. She was a thirsty woman, thirsty for men's love, only to be let down again and again. Jesus told her that whoever drinks the physical water from Jacob's well would be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water Jesus gives would never thirst. Jesus gives the Holy Spirit, whereas men's love, love does not satisfy. I was filled with the Holy Spirit through this passage, and God changed me from an empty woman thirsty for men's love to being a born-again servant of Christ. I went to University of Maryland to invite college students to study the Bible, to share with them how Jesus became my true object of worship. I still do this to this day. Praise Jesus who died on the cross for, and to forgive me of my sins through his blood. I praise God for this new life where I can depend on, upon Christ who has blessed me to get my bachelor's degree from University of Maryland and he provided me with many jobs and I got married and had a beautiful daughter who does very well in, in her high school. My husband recently divorced me because he felt we were incompatible but I, but I pray for him and know that my maker is the husband of my soul. Therese, before I baptize you, you can step down here, I'd like you to uh, affirm, just affirm your faith in Christ. Do you admit that apart from him, you are uh, a sinner in need of salvation? Yes, I admit that. And do you believe the gospel, that Christ died for your sin, was buried, and rose again the third day? Yes, I admit that. And do you call upon him as your Lord and Savior, and follow him? I commit to follow him as a fully devoted follower of Christ. Yes. Well, based on your testimony, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. <laughs> Good morning, church. 
My name is Ronald Green. I was baptized as an infant and grew up in a Methodist church. I attended church and, was re and, and read my Bible often, but I never really had a personal relationship with God. Despite this, God ha has been good to me and my family to this day. To name a few things, I have never gone a day without food or a place to sleep. I have never suffered from major illness or, di or disability. Around age 10 and during the civil war in my home country, he made provision for my family to seek refuge in a neighboring country without any struggle. Also recently I moved to the United States um, to pursue my masters. Not having all the money I needed for tuition at the time, I worried a lot, but somehow God made provision and I benefited from almost $24,000 worth of tuition waiver. But also during this period, I felt God put my life to a test and to the point that I also, sorry, to the point that, point that I had to ask for an extension to co complete my thesis project. I was suffering from anxiety, depression, loneliness, and many insecurities. So I started seeking counseling at my school, but after several weeks, I felt things were not changing, and in fact, I felt worse. Then I decided that counseling may not be what I needed. And in fact, it was during one of the counseling sessions that I realized that all I needed was to go to church, connect with other Christians, and continue to pray. So I searched around for a Christian church. What was amazing is I found people who were just like me, either still struggling or have struggled with many of the same issues I had. This encouraged me to continue to go to church and to seek a deeper personal relationship with God. It was at this point that I began to understand what it means to be born again and living for Christ. After I completed my program in December and before relocating to Maryland, I moved to St. Louis, Missouri to stay with family. I immediately joined a new Christian church and their small group. During the past three to four months in St. Louis, I met several great Christian men and women. I counseled with the pastor of my church and with another Christian organization in St. Louis. I have never felt better in my life and finally started to understand that, that the reason why I was so depressed and insecure is because I have been living in the past and feeling guilty for sins which God has already forgiven me for. I was seeking relationships in all the wrong places and I cared too much about what people think of me. Also it is now clear that our purpose on earth is much greater than us. It's not about you or me. We were put on earth to serve God and to give glory to Him. We have limited time to do so because our time on earth is temporary. I was also reluctant to be baptized while I was in St. Louis because I was fearful that baptism will not change my life and I will still continue to have the same struggles. But now I fully understand that baptism is not about being saved. It is simply a public dec declaration to demonstrate to God and to you all that I am a follower of Christ who identifies with Him in his death, burial, and resurrection. I pray that God will continue to change my life and that you all will help keep me accountable. Amen. Ronald, uh, in light of your testimony, I'll just ask you to affirm once again, do you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Yes, I do. And you've asked him for forgiveness of your sins and commit to live your life as a follower of Christ? Yes, I have. Well, in light of your profession of faith, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Miguel Moreno. Uh, good morning. As many of you guys already, have, well, some of you have already heard my testimony, but I come here again to say it to, uh, in front of everyone. I was born and raised in a Catholic family, so I, I knew who God was, I knew what sin was, and I knew the Trinity of God being Jesus and the Holy Spirit. But that didn't mean I really accepted Jesus in my life. Um, my family We've been through a lot of hardships in our life, and we still do sometimes. Being uh, raised in a pretty bad neighborhood in Northwest DC, 
we lived in a one-room apartment with seven other people. And um, one of the people that we lived with, my cousin, he was uh, involved with gangs, so I've seen things, experienced things that no kid my age should have experienced. Growing up and going to high school was probably the hardest time in my life, saying that because I was picked on a lot, so I didn't know really how to help myself and who to call to for help. And sometimes I even look, look towards suicide. But as I became a junior and senior, there was a family that's helped me in my knowledge of Christ and accepting him as my Lord and Savior. And it wasn't until recently at the, the all-nighter that I realized that God had his hand on me and he had his footprint throughout my whole life, not letting anything, not letting anything bad happen to me at all. So I come to you today to tell you that I now believe in Christ with all my heart, soul, and mind. Amen. Amen. So Miguel, you affirm your belief in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, who died on a cross and was buried and rose again to forgive you for your sins. I do. And have you committed your life to follow him as a fully devoted disciple of Christ? Yes. In light of your testimony, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Destiny, come on down. Destiny Wallace. My name is Destiny Wallace and I am 15 years old. When I decided to give my life to Christ is when I was 11 years old and from the time of 11 to now I have been really blessed. I know I was blessed before but when I gave my life to Christ at the age of 11 a lot of miracles happened. But first, first things were kind of rough between the years of 13 and 14 but when I asked God for help by praying and it didn't and it didn't work his magic right away, but after, and after praying with my mom every night, God finally opened the doors, so I am here today to give my whole life to Christ and leave the old destiny behind and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Well, Destiny, do you admit that you are a sinner in need of God's saving grace? Yes. Do you believe in Jesus, in the gospel, that he came to this earth and died on the cross yes. and was buried and rose again? Yes. And do you commit your life and call upon him as your Lord and Savior? Yes. Well, in light of your testimony, it's my privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Not least, Leighton Campbell. Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. Um, um, I've been blessed to be gro um, brought up in a Christian home. Both my parents were Christians. I have uncles and aunts, which are deacons and bishop, all over um, North America and back home in Jamaica. And that seed of righteousness was sown in me from an early age. And I've resisted um, this call of my life for years upon years upon years. But attending 4C Church, and this is where and that seed was nurtured. And I just think it's time now for that seed to blossom and to glorify God. And right now, um, three years ago, I was almost dead in terms of God broke my ankle. It was fractured really um, severely. And when I said that God broke my ankle, is that when my ankle was broken, I went to the ER and my blood pressure was 185 over 265. So just because I'm really a person really stubborn in terms of going to the doctor, and God knew that, and the only way um, to get me um, in the presence 
of some medical professions was to have that happen to me for me to go to the hospital. And the nurse was so shocked and she was saying to me that she has been doing this for 25 years and she has never seen someone which is walking and alive um, so with that reading. So that just showed me that God really loves me and cares for me and protected me all these years of my life. And, and the best testimony of all is me being alive today and seeing um, another day. And that's really something to talk about and to pray and to give thanks for. Amen. Amen. That's exciting, Leighton. Do you, let me ask you, do you admit that you are a sinner in need of God's saving grace? Yes, yes, I have. And have you uh, believed the gospel that Christ died for your sins, was buried, and rose again the third day? Absolutely. Do you commit your life to him, to follow him as his disciple? Yes. Well, in light of your profession of faith, I am privileged to baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Please sing that with me. I have decided to find. Pastor, if you would come up and lead us in prayer at this time. Our Father, many of us have made a commitment to follow Jesus, no turning back at all. We have even declared in praise and worship today that Jesus is our cornerstone and that through the storm, whatever it may be, that He is Lord, Lord of all. And yet some of us have come here with deep fears and anger and, and doubt, even with those words on our mouth. Father, we see the, um, the devastation in different places around the world, and particularly just recently in Nepal. And our hearts break, and we wonder why do things like that have to happen. So, Father, I pray for my brothers and sisters in Christ first here that you would help us to move those truths from our lips to our heart that Jesus is Lord of all. He is the cornerstone even through the storm. And I pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ in Nepal that they will have strong faith, that they will be a clear witness for Jesus in, in, in the love that they show and the care that they give to others and, and open up hearts to hear the gospel as well. I pray for those who brothers and sisters who have lost loved ones and I, I ask that you will comfort them and, and that you will draw their hearts not to fear, not to, to be angry, but to know that Jesus is still the cornerstone. He is still Lord of all and to trust you. Open that country, Father, even in, in a greater way than perhaps has been done before to the good news of Jesus, to the very presence and the power of the gospel. Many of us here also, in singing those words about Jesus being Lord and carrying us through the storm, have come with a, 
a sadness because of loss of a loved one. I know Joan Blair recently has lost her father, but I thank you that he is a believer and he is now home with Jesus. But there are many others here, and some of them, the loved one is not a believer in Jesus. And because of that, there's an even greater emptiness and a hurt. But whatever it is, Father, I know there's a loss, and I pray that you will move those words on our lips to our heart in a faith that says, yes, he's the cornerstone. Yes, I will trust him. Yes, he has a plan. I don't know what that is, but I will trust him and draw close to him. There are some of us here, Father, who have come with a real uh, fear of the unknown as we're facing uh, death, major health problems, like, like a Paul Thomas, whose cancer has returned, or Doug, uh, um, uh, Kelly Mariquin's father, who, who as well is probably very likely facing the end of his mortality. But they are believers in Jesus, and I thank you, Father, that they know that nothing will ever separate them from Jesus, not even death. That's already been conquered. But, Father, I pray that their faith will remain strong, that there will be a clear testimony of Jesus, and the family will know in a very powerful way that you are the cornerstone. Comfort them, Father. There are many here who are looking for work. You have said that if we seek first your kingdom and righteousness that you will provide for our needs, we, your followers. And so I ask, I pray that you will teach them and show them how to seek first your kingdom and righteousness in a trust that will not be shaken, in a, an obedience that will not fail because you are Lord of all and because you are faithful and show yourself, Father, faithful. In all of these ways, from Nepal to here in Silver Spring, wherever we may live, I ask that you, Yahweh, will intervene, break through, and to show the extraordinary power that you have, the wonder of your grace, and in a new way, the glory of the gospel, the power of it. As we give now, Father, I pray that you will use these gifts uh, in a way that will multiply the gospel and that we will give out of a fullness of joy hearts that are full because we know Jesus is our Lord. He is our cornerstone and he will not fail. In Jesus' name.
approximately 740 years before the days of Jesus, the great Jewish prophet Isaiah wrote about the Messiah to come. The one who would take upon himself the sins of humanity as a ransom in exchange, give eternal life, new hearts, and peace to all who believe in him. In Isaiah 9, 6, the prophet speaks, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And about 800 years after that, the great Jewish Apostle Paul, who was motivated and filled by the Holy Spirit of God, wrote in his letter to the Ephesians about the Messiah who had come. He wrote these words, For He, Jesus Himself, is our peace, our bond of unity and harmony. He has made us both, Jew and Gentile, one body, and has broken down, destroyed, abolished the hostile dividing wall between us. A song that our praise team is going to sing in just a minute in Hebrew says, Hevenu Shalom Alechem. And it means, O oh God, we beckon you that you would send your peace upon all of us. We pray for you today that you would receive Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah, as the true peace sent by God for every person that has ever been born and that you would rejoice in the salvation of our God. Amen. Heavenu Shalom Aleichem Heavenu Shalom Welcome to our platform this morning, our dear brother, Larry Durbin, who's representing Jews for Jesus and has come to share God's word with us this morning. God bless you, brother. Havenu Shalom Alechem. Good morning, which we have 10 more minutes. And you know what's really nice? The pastor left. So I may not be on time. Just kidding. 
All right, well, my name is Larry Dubin, and I, uh, I serve with Jews for Jesus, and it is a, a privilege and a blessing for me to uh, be here with you today to share a few thoughts. One thing I want to encourage you to do, as always, uh, and you will notice in your bulletin, there was a piece of paper to take notes. I want to encourage you to write some of these ideas down, take a few notes. Um, you're always free to talk to me later, and if not me, definitely, I'm sure Pastor Phil will uh, be available to speak with you. Today we want to talk about how to witness to Jewish people. If you know any Jewish people, raise your hand, all right? Well, all of you, you need to be witnessing to your Jewish friends. And if you don't know any Jewish people, then the principle is the same. Not only should you talk to Jewish people, you should be talking to non-Jewish people who don't know Jesus. So either way, what I'm about to share applies to you. Now, you know, it's, uh, it's really interesting as we think about in Mark chapter 1. In Mark chapter 1, let me see if I can set the scene. It's nighttime, and Jesus is healing people. He's preaching and he's healing people. The, 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 the miracles are a... The purpose of the miracles is so that people know that what he said is true. So Jesus is saying something. He's performing these miracles. People are being healed. It's incredible. Everybody, it says, of the, in the town, they're all gathered at the door. They're trying to get in. They're trying to, to listen. They're trying to see... What is going on? The night is over. In the morning we find Jesus alone, praying. And uh, some of his disciples, they hunt for him. They're searching for him. They're trying to find him. And they're saying, hey, people are looking for you. There's a, they're gathering up. Come, talk to them. Come, heal them. Come, provide what they need. And this is what Jesus says in Mark chapter 1, verse 38. He said, let us go somewhere else to the towns nearby in order that I may preach there also, for that is what I came out for. Jesus wasn't looking for worship at that time. Jesus wasn't looking just to have a prayer meeting. All right? Jesus wanted to preach. He wanted to help people understand the biblical message. He wanted them to understand the gospel the good news. Francis of Assisi, this is what is uh, one of his quotes. It says, Preach the gospel at all times, and when necessary, use words. All right? Preach the gospel at all times, and when necessary, use words. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2, the Apostle Paul, he gives us this uh, commandment. He says, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season. Preach the word, be ready in season and out of season. What was Paul telling us? 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 days a year, we are to be about God's business. We are to be about preaching, proclaiming the gospel. You know, it's really interesting. After you came to faith in Jesus, the Lord could have taken you home. You realize God doesn't need your money and he doesn't need your intellect. All right? You know, if you put some money into play, God isn't going to say, wow, I'm rich. And if uh, you write a book, God isn't going to say, wow, I just learned something. All right? But God left you here. He left you here because he wanted to use you as a witness, as a testimony of his love and his mercy. All right? He left you here to proclaim his story to the people that he brings into your life. Now, as I think about Jewish people, as I think about Jewish people, and remember this, if you know how to show your faith with a Jewish person, you can show your faith with anybody. All right? Jewish kids, we are taught from a very young age that we should not believe in Jesus. So if you know how to share your faith with them, you can talk to anybody. 
All right. I think there are basically three ideas when it comes to talking about Jewish evangelism. There are basically three ideas I want to share with you this morning. But I must say this. In the uh, 30 minutes that I have to share with you, we have hours and hours and hours of things that can, we can really discuss. So I'm going to boil things down to just three real quick points. But if you notice in your bulletin, all right, if you notice in your bulletin, on the first page, first inside page, it says Jewish Evangelism Seminar. Next Saturday, here at the church, from about 9 to 4, we're going to have a Jewish Evangelism Seminar. And in that seminar, we will be spending hours upon hours learning how to share our faith in Jesus with our Jewish friends. So I invite you to sign up, to come. Uh, it will definitely be worth your time. All right. So I think there are basically three areas that we can use today to help us witness to our Jewish friends. The first one is your testimony, your story. Everybody has a story, and you should use your story to declare God's goodness. In Romans 11.11, 11, in Romans 11.11, 11, this is what it says. It says, I say then, they did not stumble as to fall, may it never be, but by their transgression salvation has come to the Gentiles to make them Jealous. So, whether you, the, the they and the them in that verse, those are my Jewish people. And by our sin, by our transgression, salvation came to the Gentiles. For what purpose? To make my people jealous. And again, the principle, whether you're talking to Jewish people or whether you're talking to Gentile people, the fact that you know Jesus, you ought to make people jealous. Alright? And basically by the way you live your life, by the hope that you have, by the peace that you have, by the confidence in Jesus that you have, you ought to make people jealous. The other way to share the gospel is from Isaiah chapter 40, verse 9, where it says, Get yourself up on a high mountain, O Zion, bearer of good news. Lift up your voice mightily, O Jerusalem, bearer of good news. Lift it up, do not fear. Say to the cities of Judah, here is your God. And you will notice in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 9, the messenger was supposed to be visible, audible, and he was supposed to share his faith without courage. I want to tell you about the first guy that I saw die as a believer in Jesus. John was in his mid-80s. And at that point in life, cancer had metastasized. It has ravaged his entire body. It's everywhere. When John went to the hospital, there were three things that John would do at the hospital. Every time someone decided to touch him or speak to him, this is what John would do. He was at first, they would have to hear, the te hear John's testimony. Second, they would have to hear the gospel message. Third, John would give them a copy of the scriptures. And then, John said, now you could do whatever you want. You will notice in John's testimony, not only do we see the, uh, the making people jealous from Romans 11.11, 11, because John had an incredible sense of peace and confidence, and even though he was going through this horrific cancer uh, problem, John was still able to make people jealous because he had something that people long for, and that is hope. And then also you see John. He was very verbal. He was very, he was very vocal about who his faith was in. He, he, he forced the person to hear the gospel, to, take a, to hear his testimony, and to receive a copy of the scriptures. So John was being a, a, a great messenger at that difficult time in his life. John was using his story to proclaim God's faithfulness. All right? And no matter where you are in life, you have a story. You have something to share. You should share it. And I love what the Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 8, verse 31. He says, if God is for you, who could be against you? 
If Jesus is for you, who could be against you? Who's bigger than your God? Who's bigger than your Jesus? And the answer is nobody. All right? So, first, as we think about witnessing to Jewish people, use your testimony. Use words, all right? And let your actions reflect what you believe. The second way that we need to share our faith in Jesus, we need to use history. All right? Now, in the last 2,000 years, there's been a lot of history between the Jewish people and the, the Christian world. Now, we need to use history as a way to proclaim the gospel message. All right? Now, if you were to start speaking to a Jewish person about Jesus, because of history, one thing that they're going to do, they're going to probably just give you their hand. They might tell you that they're really not interested. All right? So you have to learn your way how to use history to your benefit so that you can share the gospel. Let me give you a couple of uh, historical facts. And if you are not a student of history... You need to be a student of history. In the third century, there was this uh, man by the name of St. John Chrysanthemum. They called him a golden mouth preacher. They said that, that this man, okay, he was incredibly charismatic. He was an incredible... Can you hear me now? There we go. He was an incredible speaker, all right? And he could just uh, tell the biblical story like nobody could in his day. But this is what is a quote of, of his. It says, and he's talking about the Jewish people. He says, The synagogue was a criminal assembly of Jews, a place of meeting for the assassins of Christ, a house worse than a drinking shop, a den of thieves, a house of ill fame, a dwelling of iniquity, the refuge of devils, a gulf, an abyss of perdition. He said, it is incumbent on all Christians to hate Jews. So you can just get an idea of the relationship, right? All right. You've heard of the Crusades. You know, the Crusades were never good for the Jewish people. When the crusading armies in Europe, when they left Europe and they descended down into the land of Israel, when they were going towards Jerusalem, part of the historical record, all right, is that we know that the crusading armies were murdering Jewish people along the way. They would sharpen their swords in Jewish community. Again, just trying to get you an idea, give you an idea of the, uh, of the history, all right? Let me, say, let me see if you know the reason, how to respond to this. In 1492, in 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. We all know that. Well, also in 1492, what happened? In 1492, the largest Jewish community in that era was in Spain. And King Fernhand and Queen Isabella, they issued an edict. And with this edict, they said, all Jewish people have three options. One, you can convert to Catholicism. Two, you can move. Where? We don't care. Three, you can die. You have 30 days to decide what you want to do. All right? So when you think about that edict, if you were Jewish... You know, you're, you're not going to think of Christian people as your friends. Another, another part of the, uh, the history between the Jewish people and the, Christ, and the Christian people, for the last almost probably 1,500 years, there have been a number of expulsions of Jewish people from around the world. 
from Italy, Belgium, England, France, Germany, Spain, Lithuania, Poland, Germany, Australia, and the Czech Republic, and on and on. So we see throughout this history, Jewish people haven't been welcomed, and so they've been wandering away. And then one more example from history. In the 1940s, there was this woman by the name of Rose. Rose was a young Jewish teenager at the time. She found herself in a concentration camp. And there was this Nazi guard who would always come up to her and say, BAM! And he would say, Jesus told me to do that. And then he would go, BAM! And he would say, Jesus told me to do that. Well, somehow or some way, Rose survived. She left Europe, she came to the States, she got married. She had a few children. And then her daughter, who was at a university, came home one day and she says, Mom, you're not going to believe what I discovered. I found the Messiah and his name is Jesus. At that point in time, Rose is very upset. How could her daughter, how could her flesh and blood go to Jesus? How? At that point in time, Rose picked up the Bible. She read the New Testament for the first time in her life. And what did she discover in the Gospels about Jesus? She discovered that Jesus wasn't a man of violence. He wasn't a man of war. He wasn't a man of hatred. He was someone who actually loved the Jewish people. And actually, he loved everybody. And he wanted the best. He wanted everyone to believe in him. All right? Rose came to faith at that point in time. But the problem in Rose's life was history. She failed to understand the real purpose of the gospel. And she was looking at the history between Jewish people and non-Jewish people. And her response was, I don't want this. All right? Until she discovered uh, that she really did want this. All right? So we have to use not only our, our story, our testimony, but we have to understand history so that we can proclaim the gospel message. And then we want to talk about the third way. The third way is to actually use scripture. The Apostle Paul, he calls the Bible, he calls the Word of God what? The sword of the Spirit. What does that mean? Was the Apostle Paul in, encouraging us to go into physical combat? No, he was not. But we are in spiritual combat. There are a lot of different worldviews out there, and we claim to believe in Jesus, so we have one worldview. So we need to use the Bible to help people understand the scriptural worldview. Now, there are two verses that I want you to write down and go look at these verses in a bit. Okay, the first one is Amos chapter 3, verse 7. And these verses, they're bookends. They give us some incredible instruction on how the entire Word of God is put together. In Amos chapter 3, verse 7, this is what it says. It says, Surely... The Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secret counsel to his servants, the prophets. Before God does anything in human history, he tells us what he's going to do. All right? Before God intervenes in human history, he tells us what he's going to do. And how does he do that? He sends prophets to come and speak. And as you read through the Hebrew Testament or the Old Testament, you read a number of different prophets who came and told us what God was going to do in human society. Then the next verse that you need to look at, in Acts chapter 17, in Acts chapter 17, verse 11, the Apostle Paul, he is preaching in Berea, and this is what it says. It says, Now these were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica, for they received the word with great eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. It's like this. Paul, as he's preaching in Berea, 
He said that those in Berea were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica. That's almost like saying, you know, the people in Silver Spring, they're more noble-minded than those in Washington, D.C. All right? Why did Paul say that? He said because those people in Berea, they heard what Paul was preaching, and instead of just believing it, they said that he, they went back and they searched the Scriptures daily to see whether what Paul was saying, whether that was predicted. Well, Paul wasn't talking about the New Testament primarily. Why? Because the New Testament was still being written as we know it. What was Paul referring to? He was referring to the Hebrew Testament or the Old Testament. Remember, before God does anything, he tells us what he's going to do. A couple of verses. A couple more verses to look at. In Deuteronomy chapter 18, in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 15, this is what it says. It says, The Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your countrymen. You shall listen to him. Before Moses' ministry, before his service was done, Moses said, God is going to raise up for you someone greater than me. Basically what he was talking about, he was talking about the Messiah, the promised one, the Christ. All right? So it's predicted. Then we move on, and we fast forward a little bit of time in the book of Isaiah. And I wasn't, this wasn't planned. I wasn't, uh, uh, I didn't coordinate with, with Jonathan about this verse. But in, but in Isaiah chapter 9, in Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7, it says this. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. All right? So again, before God does anything, he tells us what he's going to do. And then, a son was given. What does that mean? A son was born. A son came into this world in Matthew chapter 1, Verse 21, it says this. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sin. So at the appropriate time, according to God's timing, what was predicted happened. A son was given. And then what did that son do? Jesus, as he grew up, he went around preaching the gospel and eventually he went to the cross and he died as the ultimate blood Passover atoning sacrifice. And then, in John chapter 19, verse 30, Jesus says, It is finished. What was he talking about? He was talking about the price for sin has been paid. And he said, I am the one who just paid the price for you. Now it's really interesting as we think about this sacrifice. In Isaiah chapter 53, it's a, it's a very famous chapter, and there's been a lot of debate about this chapter. In Isaiah 53, the rabbis claim that Isaiah 53 is actually pointing to the Jewish people. The rabbis say it's the Jewish people who are the ones who are being sacrificed for the sake of sin. It is the Jewish people, it is their blood that is needed to atone for the sin of the world. All right? Well, there's a problem with that interpretation. From Exodus, from Exodus chapter 12, we know that the blood atoning sacrifice had to be without blemish. Well, we know that the Jewish people are not without blemish. So, Isaiah 53 cannot be referring to the Jewish people. What does Isaiah 53 uh, represent? Isaiah 53 represents the Messiah. And when Jesus came and he died as the ultimate sacrifice for sin, it was predicted. Jesus said that uh, in Isaiah 53, I believe it's verse 5, he says, 
we are healed by what? His transgressions. So as Jesus went to the cross, as Jesus received what we deserved, guess what? We are healed. Our sin is atoned for by his blood. So, how do we witness to Jewish people? We witness by using our testimony. We use words and we use our actions. Two, we have to understand history so that we can uh, understand what Jewish people are thinking. And three, we need to use Scripture. When we understand Scripture, when we understand the story, we could use it. Let me tell you a quick story about Isaiah 53. I had a, a friend, her name was, Le- well, I still have a friend, her name's Leah. And Leah was a young woman at the time, and her dad had just died. And Leah was basically studying the Bible with one of my, with one of my friends. And uh, Leah said, you know what? I'm no longer interested in studying the Bible. My dad is dead. I want to be wherever he is. I don't care. Well, my friend told Leah to go read Isaiah 53. So Leah went home. She opened up her dad's Bible. And on the the side of Isaiah 53, it said, Yeshua, the Jewish Messiah. The next time my friend and Leah got together, Leah says, well... In Isaiah 53 in my dad's Bible, it said Yeshua, the Jewish Messiah. She said, who's that? And my friend responded, Yeshua is the Jewish, is the Hebrew way to say Jesus. The scriptures point. So not only do we use our testimony, not only do we use history, but we use the scriptures to help Jewish people understand who Jesus is. The Apostle Paul, he said, one man plants, another waters, but it's the Holy Spirit who brings the increase. So as you go about life, at school, at work, at play, may the light of Jesus shine not just in your heart, but may the light of Jesus shine through your heart, so that when people see you, they will wonder why you are so different. And when they, when they start asking that question, guess what? You now have a door. You now have an opening, whether Jewish or not Jewish, to proclaim, to share your hope, the gospel of Jesus with them. Amen? Amen. If, you're, if you know, is everybody here aware of Jews for Jesus? Raise your hand. If you're, really? Wow, that, this, is, this is fascinating. I wish Pastor Phil was here because I would look at Pastor Phil and, and instead I have to look at Jonathan. Pastor Jonathan. You know, if Pastor Phil was here, this is what I would say. I'd say, Pastor Phil, you're a Dallas Seminary grad. I'm shocked. I mentioned Jews for Jesus and not everybody has both hands up. What's up with this? You know, I thought this was a church. I thought the Bible was being taught here. Did we not send you our best people? Peter, James, Paul, and John? Were they not all Jews for Jesus? So I would expect everybody to have both hands up. All right. This group that I'm a part of, Jews for Jesus, we started in the mid-70s. There were all these Jewish people who were searching for truth. And a man by the name of Moish Rosen, he had noticed these young people, He approached them. He shared the gospel of Jesus with them. They came to faith, and then he sent them back out to do evangelism. All right? When we do evangelism, we talk to everybody. We talk to Jewish people. We talk to Gentile people. We go out and we proclaim the good news. Now, one thing that we have at Jesus for Jesus, we have a newsletter. The newsletter is free. It comes out once a month. I think everybody should sign up for our newsletter. Why? Because with our newsletter, we will give you ideas on how to share your faith with a Jewish person. Remember, 
If you can show your faith with a Jewish person, you can show your faith with anybody. Another reason why I think you should receive our newsletter is because I need my brothers and sisters in Christ to be praying for us. You may not be able to join me on the streets of D.C. or in Israel, wherever I might be at the time, but you can be a part of this ministry. How? When you receive our newsletter, you will have an idea of what's going on, and you can pray for us. If you need uh, some more information on how to witness to Jewish people, I want to invite you to Saturday's uh, seminar, it will be worth your time. Let me pray for you. Lord God, I just come before you in the name of Jesus. And Lord, I want to lift up my brothers and sisters in Christ to you. And I want to pray, God, that you would be honored and glorified by each one. I pray that you would use each person here to proclaim the gospel, whether with words or by deeds. But I pray that the light of Jesus would shine deeply and greatly through all of these people here today. Lord God, whether at work or at school or at play, I pray, Lord, that these people here will impact this community for the kingdom of God. Use each one as your messenger. Thank you, Lord, for them. Be honored and glorified by them. And it's in your name, Jesus, that we pray. And all of God's children said, Amen. Amen. Please stand with me this morning. trust that as you go, that you will go in the shalom of Yeshua, that you would go in the peace of Christ, that you would be looking for opportunities to share, excuse me, to share your story, to share history, to share through God's word, his love and his desire to meet every person in their need of salvation and bring them peace and forgiveness. God bless you. We have a wonderful week. We're looking forward to seeing you again. Take care.